Welcome to the Product Boss Podcast, where we help product-based businesses grow their sales and improve their strategies. Hey, everyone. I want to introduce you to my co-host and biz bestie, Mina Kunlo-Sita, an Amazon guru that has built a multi-six-figure product-based business. In introducing the other half of the product boss, Jacqueline Snyder, she has helped launch and grow over 500 fashion apparel and accessory brands, even one of her own. And together, we share our inventory of secret weapons that will help you dig deep and do the work it takes. Are you ready? Let's build together. Hey, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Product Boss Podcast. I'm your host, Jacqueline Snyder, with my talented co-host, Mina kunlo Sita. Hey, Mina. Hey, Jacqueline. So we are so excited about this episode to share with you guys today. We are going to talk about, if you listen to Mina on the Biz Chicks podcast, she had this little nugget of wisdom, and she says it all the time to our masterminders and to the people we coach. And what she likes to say is, it's not a mistake, it's just data. Right. So from every experience, every dollar spent, you'll get some sort of gem as to what not to do again, for sure. And um, maybe just somehow that you could move forward, but differently. So you can fully optimize every little penny that you're spending in your business. So we want to just take a look at all at the things that sometimes feel like you failed or sometimes when you feel like you have to pick yourself back up and see what you can pull from that, what data you can pull, and again, what gem. So speaking of our masterminders and coaching, we have launched the mastermind and it is incredible and we love the group of businesses that are in there right now. And we are also coaching. We are doing strategy session coaching with our clients and our listeners and it has been so exciting, right, Mina? Yeah, super exciting. And our strategy sessions are slightly different because they're more one-on-one and then, well, one-on-two. So myself and Jacqueline and then with your business and then it's just way more intensive. I feel like there's, you know, one thing we're working on for a full 60 minutes and you just really get deep with each other. (laughs) And so oftentimes when people decide to hire us for a strategy session, they've usually felt like they've made a mistake. So we had a couple clients come to us that had like a legal issue with their business and it felt like maybe perhaps it was a mistake and they needed to figure their way out of that. And so what we were able to do was collect that data from what they were doing and then sort of forecast for them on a plan and strategy on how to move forward. So some ways that we've worked with people, you can also work with us one-on-one if you'd like, but I think the best uh, investment for your business is usually probably to work with both of us just because I think like Mina was saying, you get this really diverse background from us. And if you listen to the podcast, you know how we speak. So some of the the sessions we've had have been focusing on multiple platforms for sales, Amazon, um, doing sort of like a website analysis and looking at the the product that the client has had and what they should be doing with it. So for example, one of our clients had a lot of product and not a lot of sales. And so they basically, as Mina always says, iterated on everything without knowing what was actually working. So we were able to go back in, look at the data, and then come back and say, you know, what if you reduce this? What if you really pull this down to a few core styles and see how that goes and have a really, really clear brand message? And they have been just making amazing strides ever since. Yeah. A lot of times it's like you're reeling from a something that's happened. So a lot of times it's like a copyright infringement or having to completely rebrand or, you know, making a really big decision and your self-doubt starts to creep in and you need that guidance of two experts to tell you, this is what you should do and this is how you can move forward. Because it's really hard to get yourself out of your own little, you know, bubble of, oh my gosh, is this the right decision? And it's a lot easier when you have somebody in the outside looking in and being able to actually Jack and I meet ahead of time. So if you ever book a strategy session with the both of us, we meet ahead of time, talk about your business. And that way when we come to the strategy session, we know kind of what direction you should go in. But first, you know, we chat it out with you. So that tends to change a little bit, but we go in knowing, you know, what your main strengths are. And that's really what 
Like that's my favorite part is showing somebody, here's your unique selling point. Here's how you can move forward. And this is, you know, your secret sauce. And that's a lot of times what people need help with. Mm -hmm. Just a little bit of clarification. Yeah. So the way that the strategy session works, if you're interested, um, if you head over to the product boss website, theproductboss.com and you click on work with us, you have the ability to apply to have a one-on-one session with us. And then what we do is we send you a worksheet to fill out about what your current struggles are. So we really get to kind of dig into your business in your words. And like Mina said, we meet and talk about it. And that's when you actually can't get Mina and I to shut up ultimately because we get so excited about these new businesses that we're about to work with. And we're just like, what about this? And what about that? And this looks so great. And maybe they should change that. And so we get excited. And so when we get on the call, you know, we're just as invested into our listeners because that's why we started this. We want product businesses, like product entrepreneurs to really take off and live the lives that you've imagined and hoped for. And so we're just honored to be able to work with you and talk about it. So again, if you're interested, take a look at our website at theproductboss.com and click on the work with us link. And then you have the ability to work one-on-one with either of us or one to two, which I would say we have seen. It's a really good investment for big, big ideas in your business or if you've hit a roadblock and you need some experts to basically come on in and and clean up the processes or clean up the mess. Yeah. So our episode today is all about, it's not a mistake. It's not a mistake. It's just data. And we won't edit that out. That wasn't a mistake, me making that mistake. (laughs) (laughs) We're recording this on a Friday after a very busy week. Versus when uh, we do things on Mondays. So this is data saying like, hey, maybe Fridays aren't the best day. (laughs) (laughs) I know. Um, But we, right now it's a busy time. Jacqueline and I are getting schedules back together. We're getting routines set and we're behind, which is okay because we're still making it happen. So do you want to start out with some, you know, ways that people are making mistakes in the product biz? Sure. I just want to jump in though and say that we're probably not behind. We actually are juggling so many balls that we're able to, if we had like the normal amount of like three ball juggling, then we'd be fine. But the fact that maybe both of us have about nine each, there's some late nights happening, but you know what? We love working. So let's talk about how it's not a mistake. It's just data. So one of the things I wanted to just say is that oftentimes, when do you feel the biggest sting? Like when do you, when is that when you sit down and you go, oh my gosh, I've lost money. That was a huge mistake. I think money is is the biggest factor, like the the pain point that you'll probably experience. And so I would also like to say that time is money. So if you're losing time or you're losing money, that's usually the time that um, you know, all businesses might feel a little bit devastated, feel like they've kind of they're down and they need to get back up. Yeah, that physical reaction, right? You can feel when you've lost a lot of money. You can feel when you've lost a lot of time. You literally want to puke. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And I mean, time. And so, like, if you go to time is money, it's like whether you're spending your time doing something. So, like, you spend all this time on a launch, right? But your time, your time is worth something. There's a value there, you being the owner of your business. Or it could be the time that you've invested into an event or a trade show. So jumping into this, um, some of the mistakes that sometimes people feel are like product mistakes, for example. That's a very good, big, general one. Um, if there has been a mistake in somewhere in the in the development or production of your product, that usually stings because it's usually a financial loss. And so what data can you gather from that? So, you know, what are some examples of mistakes slash data that you've gotten? Hmm. Well, in the process and in packaging. So I would consider packaging part of the process. So many times, you guys, spelling and grammar mistakes. Like, I don't know what it is. I'm just in like a major hurry, but this is one in a million blip of the things I'm doing. So some examples are I've, you know, lately... Let's let's just do some lately ones. Um, so I came out with a transportation design, but on the front is a transporation. I forgot the second T, but it's in <laughs> tiny, tiny print. And though I run it through spell check and everything, I don't know why that didn't get picked up. But 
you know, I basically, I'm selling a whole bunch to Bloom and covering it up with a Bloom special code sticker, even though, you know, I just, for some reason, I just, it bothers me. I, my husband didn't notice. My sister didn't notice. My sister is very much like me where she like catches on to spelling mistakes, like very quickly and she didn't notice. Um, and she's stuffing them, um, with her husband. So I was like, okay, well, at least I know that it's not like a really big, you know, red thing saying alert, alert, you know, spelling mistake here. So, um, I'm covering up, covering it up nonetheless, and it looks really good. And, I am so frustrated about it. Another one. (laughs) (laughs) But what would you say then? So in terms of turning that into data, what are you able to pull from that mistake where it's not just a mistake? I think that it's just make sure that you're going through the, your checklist and your process. When I was in the graphic design field, we had literally a one sheeter of make sure that the bleeds. So then if it's like color running off the edge, make sure it's at 0.125. Make sure that um, there's crop marks. Make sure that the colors are in CMYK. Things like that. And, you know, for a general person that's not doing that and it's not the graphic design person, make sure that they're running spell check and make sure that they're giving you the file in JPEG as well as in PDF. And then if it's a vector file, you know, make sure that everything is outlined and not in the font. So this is another thing. When you turn something into an outline, let's say transporation is changed to outline, spell check will not pick that up because it's then outlined. It's like dotted up, you know, into artwork and not into letters. And so you really need to build in a process where you're better about it. So that's my data is that obviously I'm horrible at this. <laughs> I'm, I'm slacking. You know, I, I lived in that world for so long when I was in graphic design. And now that I'm doing it, you know, on part of low labels, I've obviously eased up on the processes because it's my own business and I need to be better about that. So I just want to pull what uh, something out of that that you said, and I think that we can all do this in our businesses. So there are certain things that we do often, right? So if you're changing up your packaging or, or let's say spell check, kind of like you said, there was this one sheet. I would love our listeners, and I think we should do it ourselves. Um, if there's anything that we do, like three types of things perhaps that we do often that we eventually could offboard, right? So Mina, you don't always have to do your own lettering and especially not your own sort of like checking the copy. Um, and that was something you wanted to hand off to somebody. If you created a checklist of all the things you would want them to do to make sure that the, whatever you're asking them to do is correct and then start doing that. And then you could live it and go through it yourself. And then for example, if you're able to hire on a team member and that's not their job, you would give them the checklist. And I would say the same thing goes for production, which is why oftentimes like for fashion, you have tech packs because you're actually telling them these are all the steps to take to make sure that the end the end result is approved. Yeah, for sure. So it saves you time and money because you've built in that that kind of like that buffer, right? It's a, it can be a person or it can be a process. And if it's a really simple process, it could be for sure a different person that's just like going through the checklist and being like, okay, you know, these are simple enough things to, to check and a monkey could do it or a machine, you know? Yeah. So it's really a simple process. So for me, kind of what I was leading into was that whole, the production process of things. So if you don't have a checklist, so I had a team of people working for me and I had a team of people working for me handling full on productions. And so I actually, certain things, for example, when we would drop off all the pieces, because in fashion, you have all the things, you've got labels and hang tags, you have to you know, tell them what thread color you want to use. You might even have to supply your own thread, the fabric, the patterns. There's so many little things, typically if you're managing your own production. And so what would happen is there would actually be delays in production. And so we would bring stuff. And then if, if you know, for example, care labels were missing or there weren't enough care labels, then um, the production would actually be put on hold because most of the time these facilities wouldn't go and start until things were, everything was there. Right? They didn't, they're like, we're not going to start until everything is here because they have their own process. So we created a checklist basically of do you have this? Do you have that? We brainstormed all the things that you should have to pass something on. So I think of a mistake, like I'm saying, in terms of the production being delayed due to not having all the components, what we ended up starting to do was then taking that data and realizing this actually sets the whole process back. We would do a kind of like a pre-production meeting where we would actually calculate and gather all of the things we needed plus give them extra 
because in fashion, they lose everything for some reason, like everything. Like where are the thousand labels I gave you? I don't know. So, um, so <laughs> we would actually do a pre-meeting where we would, we would gather all the things we needed. Then we would create a delivery receipt to the contractor, go over when we delivered all of the things that we were delivering and then have them sign off on that. Yes, they received it. That way, if they lost a thousand labels and they signed, no, no, we delivered you a thousand labels. They were either financially responsible for it or they just had to get up and look for things. So I would say when it comes to production and actually creating the product, there are so many steps. So getting to know the, who you're working with, because I'm sure you know with who's manufactures your stuff, you know, be it the soaps or little labels or whomever else you've worked with, there's different ways to order and different ways that they probably work. Yeah, I love that. Um, I think that also you should create a process for when you quality check. Mm -hmm. So um, if you get a package, let's say I ordered some labels, I need to pull from, you know, one package from every other box or whatever it is, because you're not going to check every single box. You if you have a ton of inventory. So you're pulling randomly from, let's say, every other box and you're checking it off to say, that's okay. You're checking, like, for me, it'd be the adhesive. I could have caught that way <laughs> ahead of time, you know, and then you're putting it into inventory after it passes quality check. So that is where you're adding to your inventory because, you know, just think I'm adding my labels inventory, I'm adding the fronts and backs, I'm adding the, you know, little plastic bags that they go in. So that is part of inventory when it comes to the pre-packaging, you know, before it gets really packaged up into what it is. So that's basically a a very simple process that you could put into your day-to-day check is having a quality control person. And that probably is you. You know, if you, let's say you ordered something from your manufacturer and you happen to be a candle manufacturer, you're a a candle business, you need to randomly check those boxes to make sure nothing's broken. And let's say it's a huge shipment. You don't want to have to check every single one, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, So it's just a way to you know, one sheet it with that as well. And then it can move on to the next part of the process into inventory. So what we'll do, and we'll put a, we'll put a link to it in the show notes, but I'll show you guys a sample checklist that I've used for my clients for designer consulting co-op. This is for fashion, but just kind of an example when, and so it says in order to create a sample, the following are required and there's little check boxes. And so what you're saying, Mina, like quality control, huge, because people don't look at all the things and So I think once you go through a quality issue, like you've talked about um, the fact that you didn't have the right adhesive for your labels at one point or something else happens. Once you go through that, you know to look for it next time. It's like a red flag. But what about the things you don't know? So as you start to gather all this data on all the things that can go wrong, you can start writing that down. So I'm just going to go back to garments since that's something that I work with often. Um, You look for stains, you look for holes, you look for sewing issues, you look for consistency, like uh, the left shoulder matches the right shoulder. You've literally been on Voxer with me when I've been Voxering you about like uneven darts (laughs) 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 when I was quality controlling for clients. Um, And so so as you do that, and again, all of these processes, you want to be like that wash and repeat, right? So you want to be able to then hand these things off to people, but also for yourself. Like, oh, I wish I knew to look for that. Or I wish I knew when I created my purchase order to ask for that because you assume that people are mind readers and people are not mind readers. Yeah. One of the issues that we've come across is, you know, those little plastic bags that are labels go into, they are not perfect at the manufacturer, believe it or not. And so sometimes they come in and they're 0.25 off. But we only have a 0.25 buffer for the edge. So if it's off, that makes it so the people that are stuffing or fulfilling the labels inside the packages, they don't have any give room. Mm -hmm. So when I'm hiring on a new person, I always say, if it's really hard to stick in there and it tears, that means you've lost your give room and that means that entire package is off. So Uh move on to the next 100 pack of those, you know, plastic bags basically. And so even knowing to, sh- to tell them, because normally if you've hired somebody on, they work for you for, as a contract, they will try to make it work. You know, they try to stuff it in there. They don't even know that there's, you know, that chance of it being 0.25 off. But since we've encountered that, and that happens in the garment industry too, 
you know, things are off just by a little bit. It happens in the printing industry. You know, that 0.25 is off and you're just like, I thought this was supposed to be business card size, but it's actually, you know, 3.725. That basically makes everything different, you know? So it's, it's that way for so many things of your packaging and everything. Yeah. And, and exactly what you're saying. So we've gone through it enough times. Like we intimately know our product and our processes that we know the things to look for versus someone else could spend a ton of time, you know, dealing with it. So, um, okay. So speaking of specs, one of the other things that you were saying that was like a, not a mistake, it's just data or like wrong size boxes. <laughs> the bane of my existence a lot of times. Um, I visually, you know, I don't know what it is. Like I don't measure correctly or don't interpret correctly. So I'll order the wrong size box. I've done this recently when um, I wanted to fit like these charcoal sponges in them to make like a detox kit. Then I was like, oh shoot, I didn't account for whatever. I I know a hundred percent I'm going to you know, that it's just because I don't take the time to do it. Like I'm grazing over those parameters. I'm like, okay, this should fit. Right. But then I don't double check myself. So, I mean, and a lot of it is to do with that. Like, it's so cheap. Like, you know, these are 10 cent boxes that I'm like, oh, I should grab these up while I have the chance and they're on sale or whatever. (laughs) And then I get them like, no, my husband's always like, Jacqueline, just because it's on sale doesn't mean you need to buy it. I was like, I don't understand that concept. <laughs> <laughs> what are you saying? <laughs> but, it, but, it, but it makes, it's, yeah, sometimes yeah. it can overcomplicate your life. So yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, specifications for anything, whether you're ordering, you know, your product, you're ordering your boxes, you're ordering your bags. There is, I bet all of us have a lot of something in our house because we ordered wrong. Yeah. For sure. Like or boxes. Office. Yeah. <laughs> Those boxes though, it was supposed to be for like a fun promotion thing too. So I think that's another thing. Even if you're doing it for fun, you need to implement the same processes. Uh-huh. And so with me, I definitely have to take my own advice and be better about packaging specs um, instead of going off of, oh, these look just about right, you know? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So what would you say another thing is uh, like another mistake with products? For products, I think one of the things, you know how we always say work on the ground floor up because you'll know the mistakes that are being made. So right now I am packaging my own soaps, guys, with gloves and everything on. (laughs) And so I've been doing this because I need to ship out like 500 of them. Well, mistake number one, make sure you wear gloves because then your hand will smell like charcoal and soap if you don't. Um, Also, when it comes to specs, this is something Jacqueline brought up to me. The box is slightly bigger than the bar, which would be fine in normal instances because it's a white bar or whatever. So it's a white box on the inside, and but since it's a black soap bar, it's rubbing off on the inside. Now, is this a mistake? Hmm. So Jacqueline gave me this feedback and I thought, this is really good. I should change this. But then it would make me change the entire artwork. And I was like, is it worth my time? And is a normal consumer going to even notice? You know, I had asked Jacqueline to dig hard and look for things that she would, you know, pick out that might be able to be changed. So when you ask somebody for feedback, they're going to give you feedback. So I didn't change it. I actually sent another run of packaging to there. I did fix the made in the USA (laughs) mistake of the, you know, the, and the USA being blended together um, and not having a space between, but I didn't change the size. I didn't change the specs because I wanted just to do a simple rerun with the, you know, the space being put in. So that's something where, yeah, the data is you take the data and you decide, should I change it or should I not change it? Is it worth my time? Is it worth my money? Will the normal consumer pay more for it or will they pay less for it? Will it stop them from buying my product? Probably not. No, you know. I mean that I've never in my life said, "Oh, this soap should have a smaller box." <laughs> <laughs> but when asked, when asked, so that's something I tell my clients oftentimes, um, especially ones that work with sales reps, for example. And sales reps are constantly like, "You should do this, or you should do that, or you should, you know, make a unicorn fly." Basically, like I don't know, if that's a weird example. That would but be a Pegasus. A Pegasus. Right. No. <laughs> You should make a drone in the shape of a unicorn, a unicorn. Okay. I'm tired. So 
By the way, guys, I've been up to since till three o'clock in the morning the last two nights. So I apologize ahead of time, but I have been working on stuff for my business. So what I do want to say though, is you will receive data. And exactly like Mina just said, it doesn't mean it needs to derail you. It doesn't need to shift you. It doesn't even need to pivot you because again, it is actually just data. So it's the same thing that you listen to polls and politics Um, You can make choices. You can make educated choices. You can take a look at things. You can see if, you know, data repeats itself. But if someone tells you change your pack, like the packaging maybe could be smaller and you're deciding, you know, I'm not going to rework my entire, like this three-dimensional box artwork for this purpose because it's really not that big of a deal because it would cost more money. Don't do it. It's totally fine. If you've decided, if Mina and I tell you to do something and you feel like it doesn't align with your business or your plan for now, don't do it. So all it is, is like, like we said, data, you're going to take it in, you're going to make, and you ultimately are going to make the decisions for your business. And whatever decision you make is the right one for what you're doing right now. So moving off of product, Another place where you kind of feel that financial burn or that time burn is when you have when you're doing marketing. So like marketing and trade shows where that's a big place that people sometimes feel like they're losing money. Yeah, trade shows, PR reps, what sales reps, <laughs> pay per click. Um, <laughs> what else is there? Facebook ads. You know, so, so, so many. social media managers, um, <laughs> all of the things, right? Like photographers a, sometimes. Yes. I mean, I think like you sampled it once, right? You did two photographers. You hired two Mm -hmm. photographers to do work for you. And fortunately you did because I think you favored one photographer over the other. For one product though. So I favored one for low labels and then I had her do Oasis Soap. I didn't like her for Oasis Soap. So some data in some decisions are not the correct ones. So Mm -hmm. I went with that, you know, one because she did great with little labels. But when she brought me back the soap ones, which I did have to pay for, mind you, they were too um, traditional and not modern looking enough. She used like a soap dish that was like rounded and it looks like straight from the 80s or something. Um, And I didn't want my photos to look dated. And so I had her redo it, but she didn't remove... I told her I want them to look more modern. Apparently, people have different ideas of modern... (laughs) So this is what I'm saying. Like sometimes the data and the decision is not correct. So if I were to coach you, for example, <laughs> and, and so for example, right? So Mina, this is the process. You tried out two photographers to, to get data back on who you thought was a good fit. Then to, to send your second product to your second product wasn't ideal for what you wanted. And then you asked for a redo. What I would say that I would have pulled from this is realizing that when you do a photo shoot or you're hiring anybody that you have a very, um, like a brand book or images associated that you can be. And also we've talked about like, you know, your mission, your vision and your values for the business so that you could then share that with whomever is working on your, uh, brand and they're aligned with it, right? So if Oasis Soap is actually totally like feels different and Oasis Soap is like modern, it's for like the person who's up on charcoal and all that, then maybe if you had shown kitchens or bathrooms that you would love to see Oasis Soap in, that would have given her more direction. So the data here is also, maybe not that she's not a good photographer, but that as the business owner, you probably just, you need to next time give whoever you're investing in, better direction. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's super important. If you build something out in Trello or if you build out a PDF of your brand guidelines is what they're called, like your colors, your feel, even if it's words that really resonate with you, um, it really helps the other person interpret what you're trying to say because people don't phrase things in the same way. Just like there's different photographers for different things. It won't turn out exactly how you expect. You know, mm-hmm. unless you tell them. So like even a Pinterest board or a Canva board, those are all very manageable for people. But it's it's it, the same thing with photo shoots, like it, with my clients. I talk to them about their models, right? And even for you guys, you might hire a model and you get to make that choice. But you also want to direct, you can get feedback from the photographer, but you want to also direct them in what your, your needs and wants are so they don't get carried away. I worked with a photographer that gets so excited about the photo shoot. He just is like, yeah, yeah, do that, do that. And it's very artistic, but it's not focused on what, you know, let's say my product needs are. Um, and then also hair and makeup, for example. If you let anybody do hair and makeup, you're going to get all sorts of versions of whatever, whatever they think in their head it should look like versus, you know, um, you may 
she might put red lipstick on your model and you might decide, you know, red lipstick is not on brand. So being really clear with that. So speaking of trade shows, for me, some of the mistakes I've made are going to the wrong trade shows. Um, trade shows are very costly, especially in fashion. Like they could run you $5,000 and more. Plus most of them you have to travel to and you have to set up your own booth. And so some of the learning things that I've gotten are, are the right trade shows to be at. So when I sold Cuffs Couture, I was at Accessories the Show, for example, and Accessories was great. People were there to buy accessories versus moving into Project, which was sort of the... It was mixed. It was definitely like if you imagine like who sells to Nordstrom's and Bloomingdale's and potentially like Neiman Marcus and Barney's, they're at Project. Well, my product was a little bit more niche and it made sense for people who were looking... Specifically, they were looking for accessories, whether they had accessory stores... Uh, another, another group of businesses that like to buy accessories are hair salons. Oftentimes they'll go in a hair salon and they have like a cute little boutique in there. Um, and so the data that I got were twofold. Wasting money in, on a floor that doesn't make sense for my product. And then hair salons. Never in my life did I realize, oh wait, like hair salons actually, they don't have retail environments. They don't have like full built out retail environments, but they do buy some products usually on the counter. They're small and they're at the accessory show because they're looking for hair things. They're looking for um, a little bit of jewelry, you know, sometimes brushes and combs, you know, little like either gift items or things to add to the look that you're getting when you walk out of the hair salon. Yeah. um, So I was listening to somebody else's podcast and she was a service-based person that was moving into products and she was sharing her strategy and her strategy was trade shows. And I think she was talking more about those gift ones. And she said, yep, she just started. And what she's going to do to scale is she's going to do all the trade shows she can, hire people to be at other trade shows and have like six trade shows going on at once. Do you think that this is a good idea? (laughs) So this is what really scares me about the advice that people take from service-based people is that it is a money suck, right? And no, I would not advise you to do that because one, there's location. Two, you're hiring people. So you're not the person that's selling. Three, who knows if trade shows are where you should be at? You know, like, is it really the type of product that people are buying? And for like so many things, like that's like, don't try to scale with like, that's the biggest way to lose your money is to invest in like so many trade shows all at once with different people in different locations and think that that's going to like make you tons of money because it happens to be, you know, a trade show. But I will give you a lot of data. Yeah. <laughs> So I, and I tons agree. of data, tons like uh, about people and training. So when we talk about trade shows, there's a few. So we have listeners that are at trade shows that sell directly to the customer, right? So they're kind of like these in-person events, or sometimes like gifting boutiques, women's events at uh, like convention centers where it's like cash and carry. They might be doing farmers markets. Um, we're coming up onto the holidays, so there's like a lot of holiday gift shows that you know churches and temples and whatnot will put on. That's one thing. That's something where people are coming with money in hand to buy. But this is what I also want to ask you. Is your product appropriate for a show like that? So clothing, sometimes people go with like entire racks of clothing. Um, Clothing is a harder thing to sell. And so the data that I've received back from people who take clothing lines to places like that, people want to try them on. Do you have a place for them to try it on? Um, So if you go to a show and you don't have a place to try on, you're going to figure out next time, oh, wait, like I would have sold more if somebody was able to put it on. And if I had a mirror and these are the things that you're going to kind of like pull and and do differently. And then knowing whether these shows, if people are spending, is your price point appropriate for the type of show they're going to? What other booths are there? Um, so for example, some data you can actually get before you actually ever invest into these shows is going to the show first, like walking the show, seeing who shows what kind of people are walking around? How busy are booths? Do you see money being exchanged? And that's information that you could take to decide whether one, you're going to make the investment and how you're going to handle the show. Does it mean that there's still not going to be other mistakes? No, it doesn't mean anything. But, but all of this is stuff that you're going to learn. Yeah. Also, how are you going to process payments? And how are you going to set up your booth? How are people going to receive your product? So are there certain words that trigger them to make a purchase? So in that person's case, I would have said, do one trade show, figure out your process, 
figure out what works and then repeat it if you feel like it works, you know, and I would say market. take someone to the next one and train them yeah. and then let, and then let them sort of handle some of it. You step back and let them do it. So same thing. I had a client go to a show. She invested, she traveled, she was selling directly to the customers. And I think it was just her. And when I asked her how the show went, she's like, you know what? It was great. It was busy. The problem is, is there weren't enough of us to manage all the people walking in. So if I was busy swiping someone's card and someone else had a question, people will also get up and walk away. So she had this like opposite thing where she was so successful. She could have been so successful and she was so successful, but she didn't have the team there. So then she could try it again another time. But all of this is just stuff for you to realize. And, and the flip side is if you go to a trade show and you don't sell, that feels not so nice. And so that's when you can decide, well, what did, what happened? What went wrong here? Was it the wrong trade show? Were your price points too high? Was it not a busy trade show? You know, did you get that deal on the booth because it's really not that great of a show? So also thinking about that, whether you're going to invest in that. So we're talking about, you know, again, like farmers markets, markets, wholesale trade shows, and sort of like boutique trade shows, ones where you're signed directly to customer. Yeah. And you know, a lot of times people invest, is it worth spending that extra money for a corner booth, right? Or one with a better location instead of being, you know, the corner booth is more because it hits two lanes of traffic, basically of people walking in, not in the, you know, one direction. Is that worth it? So, so many pieces of data that you could really pick out just from attending, like what Jacqueline said, and then deciding what would work best for you. Also, you know, who you want to hire. Um, (laughs) So one of my trade shows that I've done in the past, I had my sister with me and she was a great sales lady, but she was also nursing at that time. (laughs) And so she would have to go pump every single hour. And I'm not kidding you. She was the most high maintenance employee I've ever had. She was not (laughs) equipped at that time in her life to help me at a trade show. She would have to, you know, like she had to eat more. She had to drink more. She had to go pump, you know, plus she's kind of a high maintenance person anyways. Like, you know, I love my sister, but you know, there's some people that are just complicated. That's the thing. It's like, who would best um, fill in those holes with you of being like a great salesperson and Mm -hmm. being a great admin person, maybe just, you know, working in the register or helping you fix the booth, anything like that. So obviously trade shows are like a way to show up, be visible and and a way for marketing. But some other things, some big stings that people often feel are sort of like investments into Facebook ads or pay-per-click or, um, you know, even sponsored ads on Instagram. Um, So I mean, I know you've sort of, you have a little story about Facebook ads. Yeah. I think everybody's done this. I would hope. I'm I'm assuming. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> is that they've accidentally kept their Facebook ads on. I've done that. I spent $1,000 by accident. And, you know, it's just like, oh, how, how? <laughs> and then you feel like that and you're just like, okay, now I know that obviously I'm not in a Facebook expert. If I'm leaving them on by accident, obviously I, you know, I need to have some sort of person either help me or I need to be, pay more attention. And since then I've actually hired two people on. So one person, she's, I don't know, helping me with like the video part of it. And then I like her, but she's going to have a baby very, very soon, like popping any day now. And so I'm bringing on another person and he's part of an ad agency, kind of like a Facebook agency and marketing agency, but they're not expensive. So I'm going to try them out for a little bit to see, you know, one is low labels going to sell on Facebook ads because it's such a low dollar product. And is it going to be worth the money? You know, so that's the data that I'm really trying to get is, is it going to be worth the money that I put into it? If I can make the money back, I'm totally for it. You know, so if it's like a hundred spend and then getting a hundred back, yes, that's my data. So I know going in my parameters of whether or not it will be successful. Yeah. And, and I mean, even keywords, you know, like you learn, like if a keyword fails, like, you know, what's working and what's not. So for me, my experience has been sort of like in person. So, um, especially since my business was flourishing and doing well some years ago before like Instagram was there and Facebook, but it really wasn't what 
the machine that it is now. So it's still kind of very traditional. I guess I'm the traditional one in this relationship. Um, (laughs) And so I had hired a publicist, like an actual fashion publicist and paid them um, close to $30,000 for the year. Plus I paid for gifting. So I paid probably it was about $10,000 worth of product where I personally hand wrapped it. I gifted one to the publicist or the manager and one to the celebrity and paid a delivery service to hand deliver them because I was told these are the things to do. (laughs) And so when we got to the gifting to the celebrities, I got one thing out of it and it was that I got a handwritten note from Dakota Fanning saying, thank you. Oh, sweet. Was it Dakota (laughs) Fanning though? I'm not sure. (laughs) It was on our stationery. I watched her on Twilight Eclipse. I forgot how good that movie was, (laughs) by the way. (laughs) A whole other story about Twilight later. (laughs) So I realized at that point, you know what? Like this is not a product that, because I worked for a celebrity and she would get things all the time. Like I got a pair of Timberland boots from working with her. She, Victoria's Secret gifted her a bunch of stuff when she was getting married. There was all this stuff. And what she would do is she would pick through, take the things she wanted and the rest she would tell her team, her assistants, us who ran her clothing line, like take what you want. Um, And so I should have known better. But I thought that this publicist was more tapped in where they're like, well, if you hand deliver it and you gift one to their their person and you gift one to them, then their person's less likely to take it and they'll be sweetened by the deal. So I realized, you know, my product was actually not meant for celebrities because are they like, are they going to be photographed while wearing this? When are they going to wear it? When it gets photo. So where my other investment went was I invested into a style house where a stylist came and pulled pieces. And so I dressed Carrie Underwood. She wore my stuff on the Country Music Awards. I, uh, Carrie Underwood stylist knew that we were so excited. My assistant cried at the time when she saw it live and we told the um, Carrie Underwood's team. And so then they actually had her wear it in one of her music videos. And then um, Carly Rae Jepsen wore my stuff in one of her videos. So that was awesome, right? So it was like, okay, what I learned from that was stylists were more tapped in and stylists were the ones dressing the clients for events that there would be photography. But the data that I got back was in terms of return on my investment. When you're on Country Music Awards, there's not sort of like a thing saying like, hey, by the way, she's wearing Cuffs Couture, buy it now. So it was great and it was good for the ego and it had something for us to talk about, but it wasn't something where it was like, you get to click it and they purchase it, which is why now I'm a really big fan of like um, bloggers, you know, creating content around it and talking about it. And even if you have to gift a blogger, that's where people are consuming their information and a little bit less than the celebrities, even though you get like some celebrities that will go on with their like, you know, gummy vitamins and tell you to buy it and you'll buy it. But that's because you're able to click directly and buy it from the website. Yeah. And, and then also that's brilliant, by the way, all those gems that you pulled from there. Also, things change all the time too. Um, People consume differently. This is kind of what I want to get to from what you were talking about, you know, the consumer consumption. So nowadays, people consume by binging. We know that because we have a podcast, right? People come in, they binge. They Netflix binge. They binge on articles because, you know, from Pinterest because they're looking at a certain amount of articles or blog posts in the time that they want to learn something or they're binging how-to videos on YouTube. So does not matter for you to be consistent a little bit because, you know, then you'll have that like library of binging for them to binge from. But I think it's also like if you have to just like put a ton of stuff out and cast to like a wide net, that's okay too, you know, um, and pull the data from there. So there's so many different things for sure that, you know what, sometimes things work because that person hits it at a specific time. There's no like clear data to pull from. So it could be that, oh, that person listened to that particular podcast episode, but it could be like a year later, you know? And so I think that's one thing to keep in mind as you're pulling your data is that you need to be able to make a decision or not make a decision, whatever you want to do. But sometimes it's not clear cut and it's not um, perfect, but that's okay. You're still evaluating and seeing what is best for your business. And you are the best person to be able to tell that. Yeah. Like, okay. So here's an example. So this was back in the day, again, old lady over here. Um, When people, (laughs) (laughs) but People Magazine, for example, did a whole half page on 
on Cubs Couture and showed the celebrities wearing it. Um, that's actually what launched my business, right? Cause that was because people were still consuming through magazines and it was right around Thanksgiving. And guess what I learned from that? People Magazine is at nail salons, for example, or hair salons way longer like the shelf life of those types of magazines, they stay around for a long time because people are still consuming gossip like ongoing and and people were traveling. So people would actually like, this used to be me, I'd go and buy like five of the gossip magazines and take them on the plane with me. Um, and so it was such a good time at that point. This is like, you know, 10 years ago, it feels like now, but um, it was such a good time to be in the magazine because that specific magazine, even though it came out in November, mid-November, I still had people, I had someone like six months later, say they found, I asked them how they knew about Cuffs Couture and they said from a magazine that they saw at their nail salon. And that's when I was like, cha-ching, that's amazing. Like some of these nail salons keep this stuff out for a really long time. Yeah. So smart. You know, like the shelf life of that magazine, just like doctor's offices, right? Mm -hmm. They keep them a little bit longer and you're able to like show up in people's feed, but actually it's real life. (laughs) So (laughs) I think we've all had mistakes that, that if you look at it in a positive light, it's just data. So we would love for you guys to head on over to our Facebook group. It's the product boss community on Facebook and share with us what mistakes you've made and the data that you receive back from that. Yeah. And one of the things too is that people have like experiences with other people, right? You go in a coffee chat and you're like, ooh, I want to like pull so many gems from this person. I feel like on paper we're a match. You know, this is from somebody who's had a lot of coffee chats and met the one Jacqueline Snyder. (laughs) Um, So I think you have to really go in and feel like, you know what? it's never really a mistake. You're making connections with like those people, for instance, and they're kind of shaping you a little bit, but sometimes it's not going to be that aha, brilliant Jacqueline Snyder, we'll call it. Okay. So sometimes it's not going to be the one that you're so sweet. (laughs) (laughs) And so sometimes it's not just like this huge monumental thing. It's just data a lot of times and you just are making like the best decision for your business. Absolutely. So we will share in our Facebook community um, some of those mistakes that aren't data. And there's a link to that in the show notes below. And again, if you guys are interested in working through some of your mistakes and figuring out the data that we can pull from that, then we would love to work with you one to two. So working with Mina and I in a strategy session would be ideal for your business to basically figure out what we can pull from things that you've been doing and how to move forward and how to improve your business, your processes, and your product. So you can click on that link in the show notes as well. So I have a little funny tidbit too. So sometimes I read reviews from people and I'll be like, okay, you know, people tell you read a review and try to, you know, cater to your customer. But sometimes I'm like, my evaluation is people are the worst. <laughs> <laughs> and that's okay. Just feel you what you want to feel. And you know what? It's okay. Those mistakes just take it in and, you know, grow your business. Do you, you do you. (laughs) Yeah. So on a positive note, (laughs) we want to help you with your business. Um, We are so grateful that you guys have, that you listen and that you subscribe to the podcast and um, we are here. So let's build together. Thanks everyone. This episode is over, but it doesn't have to end. Head over to our Facebook group, search for the Product Boss Biz Community, or the link is also in the show notes. Come connect with other product bosses just like you. We'll see you in there.